Well, the point of this exercise is to uh, allow our participants to face each other and ask their own questions of one another. Um, <laughs> heard Richard ask a question of Judge Smith. I'll, I'll leave that to Judge Smith, how and when he w wants to respond, if at all, to that. But why don't I just put it on the table to, to start the debate? Let's talk about the budget process circa 2015 and look forward. Does it work? Does anything need to be fixed? Is it exactly as it was? Is this something that requires constitutional reform? Judge McGuire, want to start from there? Hard to believe as it may be, I have not spent uh, much time in the last few years uh, studying how Albany is operating in the budget process. Uh, all I can say is I'm not aware of any uh, calamitous events, but uh, it's an enduringly fascinating subject, but I haven't spent enough, enough time on it, Hank, to really feel like I have an answer. I, well, I'm, I'm even more ignorant than Jim, but... <laughs> There's a contest worth not measuring. Expressing an opinion, I, uh, I, I utterly disbelieve uh, uh, the um, Assemblyman Brodsky's view that our, our our big problem in New York is too much prudence and uh, and that the uh, we're obsessed with balanced budgets and we're not spending enough uh, and uh, that we ought to print more money and do and and, and, and follow the the, the uh, uh, follow the course that has served Greece so well. I just am not persuaded. <laughs> well, if I if I said that, I I apparently misspoke. Um, what I said was that the opposing economic theory is not enshrined in the Constitution, and neither one should have a uh, preeminence as a matter of constitutional doctrine. And what you did was give the balanced budget preeminence. The, the, there is, yeah, something is enshrined in the Constitution. What is enshrined in the, uh, in the Constitution is Henry Stimson's view, uh, very clearly expressed uh, that, uh, that, it do, that the system doesn't work unless you have one man, doesn't have to be a man anymore, but unless you have somebody lying awake at night trying to balance the budget. And he said that doesn't happen in a legislature because they, 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 don't have the they don't have the accountability, they aren't responsible when it gets screwed up, and they, aren't, and, and they aren't accountable to the whole state. They're accountable to their constituents, and they sit around trading favors with each other at the taxpayer's expense, and you need somebody sitting on top of this money-making machine trying to get it under control. That is enshrined in the Constitution. And that's what uh, and that's what the case says. Okay, I'll just say I, that I, does not comport with my experience as being a member of the legislature some of the time. Can I can I just add to that though, that, Richard? That you know I think you made something about you know you go. that Silver Packy has removed the policy making power of the legislature, and I and I think that that's just wrong. I mean, the legislature, as a result of Article Seven, Four A, when it was first adopted is now the governor and the legislature legislature are equal partners. Nothing can be passed without the approval of the other branch. The leg governor can propose some thing which from your pers policy perspective is crazy and an item of appropriation. The legislature can just say no. No schooling. And strike it. No schooling. Sure. And then, and Richard, the, the, what happens then is there's political, there's, there can be gridlock. And gridlock is not necessarily a good thing, but the alternative is worse. One, one, one branch has more power than the other. Gridlock on something like school aid, which is not going to happen, right? There's going to be compromise. But better gridlock than one branch having more power than the other. And that's what we had under legislative budgeting, with the legislature having more power than the, than the executive. And now we have a balance. The, the and, notion, and there has been no failure to uh, adopt school aid since Silver Reap attack. The, the notion that the um, uh, alternative to uh, available to the legislature is not appropriating school aid is not a matter of whether it creates gridlock. It's a matter, a matter of whether you can pay teachers and whether you can have school districts that function. And that is a powerful constraint on the willingness of the legislature to create gridlock. And it is unfair and inadequate. Amendment. You don't like what's in the teacher evaluation bill? Amend it. Governor can line item veto. The, 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 Jim's argument is an argument against the power of the legislature in any area. 
That he has a constitutional special platform based on budgeting is true. But if we are a democracy, then you're just going to have to live with the notion that the uh, legislature is going to be able to say no to the governor on school aid, on teacher evaluation, or on anything else. Can I just, can I just say that, that um, I'm kind of in the middle. Um, if we just look at 2015, because you said 2015 going forward, you know, as I mentioned in my remarks, the governor this year put substantial uh, new policies within uh, appropriations. Um, however, at the end of the day, uh, I think all parties wholeheartedly and fairly negotiated a budget. Um, and I think the outcome did show that, the you know, record increases in school aid um, and other areas that not only the governor and the legislature care for. It, it, in my perspective, from being a budget director, I can never envision that school aid would not get adopted, appropriation wouldn't be enacted, because I think the governor would quickly lose the next election um, with no recourse. So it, it, it's a balance. I think in, in the most recent years we haven't seen anything come to a halt or workers not get paid. Um, and I just think it's, it's the, you know, the political stomach of those involved as to how far you're willing to go. And I don't think in the end um, anyone would have went that far. And I think the outcome was, was a good one in the end. And can I, Hank, can I just... The historic note is that the legislature added this provision to the Constitution. This was not done by a constitutional convention. So the legislature must have believed that it wasn't being marginalized. Second, a reporting a, a conversation I once had with Mario Cuomo, who when he got irritated would say, professor, so you knew that he thought you weren't a practical human being. He said that, professor, the legislature can act without me, but I can't act without them. And of course he was referencing the override. And the practical consequence of the interpretation of the Constitution and the, the creative initiatives taken by Governor Patterson are that the governor can act without the legislature. I think that's the fundamental point that Richard is making. As a practical reality, the governor can act without the legislature. And the third point is, maybe the governor won't want to. And that's the argument that the governor is making and others are making, that I don't want to because it creates too much agita, either politically or in my relationship with the legislature. But that's not the compelling fact structurally. We shouldn't be relying on whether a governor wants to get along with the legislature or makes a political judgment. We should be, if we believe it, that the separation of powers should have vitality, we should be relying on a structural arrangement that does not permit proceeding without the legislature's effective engagement. And I think that's where, where we've gotten to. I think that's the fundamental concern. Hey, Hank, can I, can I give you one minute, or one uh, word answer? You, you asked, is the, is the budget process broken? And I would answer yes. And I would answer yes because uh, we don't really have a balanced budget. We have checkbook or cash accounting. We don't have, uh, should have gap accounting. And we don't have uh, uh, an obligation to have the, the year finish in balance. We don't really have balanced budget requirement. And so there is no fixation on balanced budget. There's just a fixation on getting the budget. The last thing I would add, uh, just like in the Vietnam War, protests, everyone's saying, give peace a chance. In 2010, Governor Patterson gave negotiations every chance to succeed, and what had happened was that the legislature put itself in a position that it didn't have any real choices. But that came th three months after the uh, end of the fiscal year. I, I just want to comment on Professor Benjamin's statement that the practical reality is that, you know, now the governor can act without the legislature. And I just don't get that. I don't know why is that. What supports it? Again, the legislature can just say no. And if they believe that their hand is a politically stronger one, they can play it. And they can say no. And the governor can't do anything about it except suffer the heat of having taken his position if he insists on it. Now, another thing to consider is, how about legislative budgeting? 
In legislative budgeting, here's what the history shows, that the legislature could act without the governor. Because the governor was at the end of the process, the legislature would present him with a budget, items of appropriation, what would they do? They'd run out of town. The governor had no practical alternative in many cases. If he, if he vetoed, they might not come back. And you, the legislature mixes in good spending with bad, spend, bad spending, and the governor, as a practical reality, can't do it. So this, 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 it's false to suppose that this is some incident of executive budgeting as opposed to legislative budgeting. Uh, by the way, the uh, microphone is open, so if any of you have any questions, please come on up and, and put them to our presenters. How are you, Professor? Hi. I have a question that gets, I think, to both the law and the politics, and I'm fascinated on why it works. I presume that the restriction works and just say no doesn't work because of the Hobson's choice that it presents to the legislators. They then have to uh, defeat something that will be disaster on the hustings. But I don't quite understand, either from a legal or practical point of view, but I'm not a legislator and I'm very naive in that respect, why the legislature could not construct a resolution while the governor's budget sits there. And the resolution says, we'll pass a budget that says. And then you put that advice to the governor in a resolution and let the governor squirm. So in effect, I'm asking, why does this work or why is it that it's politically difficult for the legislature to do the kind of workarounds that a lawyer can imagine? The legislature does precisely what you have just suggested. It passes a resolution. No one pays any attention to it. But it doesn't have a force of law. Either. That's what a resolution is. It's right. an advisory judgment. You know, I want to make two points. The first one is, I really don't understand the judge's argument that it's hard to distinguish appropriations from legislation. Uh, the Congress of the United States, the House, had a rule that you can't legislate an appropriations bill. If you go back to Heinz precedents more than 100 years ago, Cannon, the other editors, there are at least 100 or 1,000 rulings on this that are common law of that distinction for the Congress of the United States. It worked very well. Um, that kind of common law could be developed on where these lines are drawn. And what the decision did was to leave the balance of that power, as the assemblyman says, practically in the hands of the governor. Because the question, for example, you can reduce, you can play with, or you can reject money items. But how do you reduce something like gay marriage? Say, one of you can get married, the other can't? Um, or say, uh, you know, school testing, reduce it. It's, money matters are different. They, they parse differently than verbal matters. And that's a fairly simple and useful distinction that's made in most legislatures. Most legislatures in the United States and in the world make that decision. The second thing, very simply, on executive and legislative spending. Pork barrel was eliminated from the legislature. They don't do member items. It goes through the governor now. It goes through the governor. You look down Madison Street, that was the water bond issue, built, rebuilt that church. It's a lovely rebuilding. What it has to do with clean water, I don't know. You look at the governor's proposal, a billion dollars, a raffle to four areas of the state. No legislative control. This is written into everything that's done now. The pork barrel, the larder, is on the second floor. Well, let me just respond uh, to part of what you said, because I think I, uh, I'm not sure I made what I'm saying clear. Uh, it is. Yeah. It is impossible, in my opinion, to have or to imagine an appropriations bill that is not legislation, that is not substantive, that does not embody policy. Of course it's possible to have legislation that is not appropriation. But the, uh, uh, to me, the uh, I'm not saying there is no distinction. There is a distinction, but, a but to, to, to try to distinguish policy from appropriation is just a recipe for confusion. The distinction you should be making is the distinction between that which is budgetary or non-budgetary, between fiscal and non-fiscal measures. I quite agree with you that gay marriage is not a fiscal measure. The, uh, the bills at issue in Silver against Pataki were fiscal measures, all of them. 
Uh, that's, uh, yeah, th and that's why I continue to think, despite the fact that there were actually people but not enough to disagree with me, uh, I continue to think that that was an easy case. Judge, can I uh, just follow up? Oh, sure, yeah, go ahead. Just, just um, where member items reside now, interesting, I, I don't know a heck of a lot about it, but member items and pork barrel are not the same thing, they're not synonymous. Pork barrel spending has traditionally been the combination of good spending with bad spending. So legislators, it could be debt that had to be repaid, and you stick in the same item of appropriation some ill-considered or some uh, expenditure designed to feather some individual legislator's district. So let's, let's be clear that the, the fact that member items may reside in the second floor now doesn't mean that there's no problem or potential problem with pork barrel spending which is a function of who authors the items of, appropri of appropriation. Judge Smith, a, a question that occurs to me, um, and it goes to the role of the courts with respect to these kind of interbranch disputes. Now, I heard what you had to say about the ultimate question of to what degree could a court issue an order striking a gubernatorial appropriation bill in some fashion. But anyone who reads your plurality opinion and all six pages of the New York reports devoted to the subject of how far a governor can go, and the repeated references to the troublesome threat that a governor could go too far, and you saying emphatically that the governor should not put into an appropriation bill matters that aren't purely fiscal or budgetary. Clearly, you were trying to say something more than just expressing views and putting hypotheticals out there. There was something you were trying to communicate, even though you didn't reach the final question. Could you try to describe, it wasn't just dictum, what were you trying to do? Well, I mean, I, I, what I was, if, I, if I was trying to communicate and haven't succeeded yet, I'm not sure I'm going to do, uh, do any better. Uh, 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 but I think I, all I really think I was trying to say is what I what I did say. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, the governor shouldn't do it. He hasn't done it. I hope he never will do it. And if he does do it, I don't know what the hell the courts are going to do about it. That's all I'm trying to say. Professor. The gentleman that asked a question about the. Uh, parallel between the state process and the, na the federal process, talked about how the House of Representatives does it and the precedents to do so. It, 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 it's more of a question than, than, than a criticism, but isn't it the case that when the House acts on these matters, they do make a distinction between a policy and an appropriation. A substantive committee agrees to pass legislation. We want to do this. Nothing will happen until that goes to an appropriations committee, which then decides whether it will be, money will be appropriated or how much will be appropriated. So they do make that distinction. In New York, we, I don't think, can make that distinction anymore. Is that a right? Is that right in terms of what we've done with Article, the, the budget? Oh, I, I, I disagree with that. I don't think, I don't think there's, I don't think, excuse me, I, I don't think there is, and I don't think that's got any relationship to reality. I mean, but what, it's the same, minute, what doesn't it's have the any same, relationship to reality? It's the, same, it's the same process. It's the same. A governor decides, you know, what the priorities are, and uh, with respect to one, uh, for example, school aid, decides after balancing priorities how much money to be, should be appropriated and what the terms and conditions of, of it are. That's just what, it's just what happens in the, in the United States, in, in the House of Representatives, isn't it? No, no well, they're separate, separate committee systems in, in there. But, 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 what, are, but why does are. that matter? Well, it matters because it, it, we can make that distinction, which we, apparently, we can make that distinction because it's made in the Congress, and the way we do it, the, the, the executive announces the policies to be enacted upon and the appropriations for those policies. I, 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 uh, I know very little, uh, of course, my knowing very little never stops me, but I, I know very little about the federal procedure. I do, un I do understand that, they do, that there is a distinction between appropriations and authorizations, and that one committee authorizes and the other one appropriates, and that always seemed a little weird to me. Uh, I, don't, I, I have great trouble seeing how that model 
helps resolve an issue like the scope of executive budgeting. Are you really saying that the governor is the appropriations committee and the, uh, and the, and the legislature is the authorization committee? Because as far as I can tell, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, those two guys make, this, make decisions on the same subjects. They just make them differently. And you haven't resolved anything by saying you can draw that line. Mr. Collins? Jim is happy because he won, and I'm unhappy because we lost. <laughs> um, I think he's aware of that. Um, so it's, it's senseless to relitigate it. I am concerned. Uh, both of the professors can tell you that the governor's power to propose appropriations came about in 1927. His power to propose legislation didn't come about until 1938. What Jim said was that the governor's legislative changes only have a year or two of life, and so we shouldn't be concerned about that. I'm concerned about that. Um, what Judge Smith said was that, um, the, that it'd be impossible to do an appropriation that didn't include policy. Um, you could ask uh, Budget Director Anglin to point out that in any budget there are thousands if not tens of thousands of appropriations that certainly express priorities without changing law or without vitiating existing law. So it is certainly possible to do an appropriation that expresses a policy desire without undermining existing law. One other thing that I heard earlier was um, that we shouldn't be concerned about a governor's desire to not be constrained by what other governors had done before him or her. Um, I suggest to you that law is not something that a governor does. Law is something that gets thought out, that gets enacted, that gets signed into law or a veto overridden and becomes something that we are all expected to deal with. If the governor would like to change the law, he has the power to make that proposal. The people of the state of New York gave him that power in 1938. That's why Article 7, Section 3 was amended in 1938, to give him that power to change the law. If he changes the law by embedding it inextricably in an appropriation, which can change the leverage in the, in the, in the process, I'm as, as Assemblyman Brodsky, although not as forcefully and not as articulately, I'm constrained to suggest that I don't think that's consistent with the framers' intent. I, I think, if I, if I have it right, you're raising an issue which was barely peripheral in Silver v. Pataki, in which I, uh, um, the, the, you, you're, you're talking about the practice of including in an appropriation bill, a true appropriation bill, forget about whether, yeah, yeah, yeah just the purest appropriation bill in the world, the words, notwithstanding any other provision of law, yes, whether sir. that works. Uh, nobody in Silver and Pataki was telling us it doesn't work. It's been, done a long t it's been done for a long time. The legislature does it all the time. It's a fairly common practice. Maybe it's a bad one. I have not, I, uh, it's not a subject I've studied. It's not a subject uh, that, that we dealt with in the case because it seemed to me that it was a, co it was a complete red herring that it is a well-established pro uh, 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 principle of New York law, whether right or wrong, that you can have the so-called notwithstanding clauses in appropriations. Well, I would disagree that's well-established because it's not been litigated to the Court of Appeals, A. B, it didn't get to you because that's the way the appellate process works. Okay. If arguments get eliminated below, they don't rise up to the Court of Appeals. Those arguments were articulated quite well, I think, at the trial level and, and were ultimately vitiated because it, they were just taken out of the case. The only arguments they get to you are the ones that remain after that winnowing process, as you're well, fully well, aware. The, 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 let's be clear, though. The parties agreed on representative samples. There were notwithstandings, so provisions in there, too. And so if the Senate and the Assembly didn't want to insist on them as, as exemplars of what was supposedly wrong, that's on them. But with respect to notwithstanding clauses, it, 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 the legislature did it when there was legislative budgeting. I don't know when the, that power to author was transferred to the governor, why a governor can't do it. But I pose this following hypothetical. The, the, the legislature and the governor have some spending program, and it is, money is going out the door, hundreds of millions of dollars, and everybody agrees it's being squandered, and somebody runs for governor assailing that program. It's, you know, it's enshrined in so-called permanent law, a statute in, in the consolidated laws. And the governor runs for office, and his campaign is, this is ridiculous. This spending is crazy. 
and he gets elected by an overwhelming majority. He can't put in his budget that notwithstanding any other provision of law, i.e. this provision of substantive law, the money should be spent on different terms and conditions? No, I suggest to you, Dim, he could, he could appropriate zero for that purpose. In other words, if a law, if he felt like a law was driving in the direction of profligate spending, then propose not to spend any money on what implementation if, what, of that but law. That he so, of course what, proposes... What if, he, what, if he, what if he thinks that it's a legitimate purpose, but the money is just being squandered, so he wants to spend some money on it, but not under this terms and conditions that he campaigned May on. I jump in to point out that this is the Putin doctrine. <laughs> this is the Putin doctrine. Mr. Collins, this is before you step down, yes. I, I, I would just like the audience to observe something that was rather remarkable we just saw. For those of you who don't know, Bill Collins was counsel to the assembly majority at the time Silver versus Pataki was litigated. Was also, you might say, one of the intellectual architects of the briefs that you, Judge Smith, read and didn't ultimately persuade you. So. I thank you for that spirited debate. It was, it was mm -hmm. fabulous to say. <laughs> the, the, the response to Darth Vader, um, uh, Mr. McGuire's um, uh, uh, response is, it's America and you get elected on a uh, platform, and if the, you can't get the law through the legislature, you don't get it. See Obama, immigration. And the notion that the, the governor can put it in, the, in, a, in an appropriation, and the legislature can't touch it, is at the heart of this principled uh, dispute about how we make decisions in a democracy. But the words shall not alter are in the Constitution. Well, if you want to do the textual analysis, shall not alter has to do with the appropriation. Now that you have enabled the word appropriation to mean a change in positive law is maybe where we have our fundamental disagreements. And you, know, and you are aware that the legislature did exactly that in the legislative budgeting, right, Richard? I'm not a fan of legislative budgeting. I'm a fan of amending executive budgets. Okay, I'm saying you are aware that the legislature, under legislative budgeting, changed what you would so-called permanent law. Jim, there is an 80-year statute of limitations <laughs> on consideration of the 1926 <laughs> amendment. We have time maybe for another question or two, if anyone in the audience. Please, come to the microphone. Uh, Stephen Schechter, just as a s small historical footnote on, on Congress, um, the U.S. Constitution provides for appropriations process. There's no provision in there technically for an authorization process. So until, actually the date is 1837, uh, the appropriations process uh, was filled with substantive policy considerations and decisions in the form of riders. And it got so uh, crazy and there were so many delays that uh, the House adopted a rule, a rule, a House rule. It was not a law, not a, a rule, in 1837, uh, providing that uh, the authorization process should proceed the appropriation process. And the Senate shortly thereafter followed suit with its own rule. And uh, that rule lasted and is still in place, as are all sorts of authorization items that creep into appropriation bills and all sorts of money items that creep into authorization bills in what we keep saying is a preeminently political process, but, but don't quite know or want to accept how to, how to work with that. It, it's a preeminently political process with the Constitution as a, as a frame around it. Thank you. Thank you. Please. I just want, want to make two observations. One is just a very practical point that no one mentions here, which is Section 5A of the legislative law that actually does come into play here as far as the legislature's choices because they probably, regrettably from their view, agreed to that law back in the late 90s or, or the early 2000s that in effect withholds their pay. So the choice of not acting has very immediate effects on them. But that's a very minor point. 
Um, more importantly is I, I disagree uh, with Judge McGuire on the four vote issue. I think um, prof the Professor Bonvaturi correctly stated that it was 4-3. I think a fair reading of the decision, and even looking from a stare decisis point of view, as opposed to sort of the more pragmatic view that the professor was outlining his point, is that the law is that if a governor's action in the future were to cross the lines laid out in Judge Rosenblatt's decision, that that action would be invalid. I think a fair reading of Judge Rosenblatt's decision is that he found the actions of the governor in that case to be within the bounds of the limits that he set forth in his concurring opinion. Clearly, the dissenters are saying that the governor crossed those lines. So you have four votes, as the professor was pointing out, saying that these limits apply, and if the action, the future actions of the governor, or if this action, more importantly from the point of view of the case, if these actions by the governor had crossed that line, and two of them thought it did, that that action would be invalid. You're, you're certainly right about counting votes. There were four votes for that position. I think what you're forgetting... I don't think Judge McGuire agreed with you. He said there weren't four votes. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I think, think I'm making... I know exactly, I think I know exactly where Bob Smith was going. Well, yeah, with the, the, the important point, I think, is that the four votes were on an issue that nobody thought was before the court, and it wasn't before the court. And uh, if there had been a unanimous decision in which, in which, they, in which the, uh, they had gone on for pages in dic uh, of dictum, on that subject, it would still be dictum, and it would not be binding as a matter of stare decisis. And it sure ain't binding because you can add, you can count up four votes in a decision uh, in a decision where the point was not decided. I and was, and I will add that there weren't four that embraced Judge Rosenblatt's test. Well, I think two, clearly, clearly the two dissenters, two clearly the two dissenters were saying that the governor had crossed the line. I'm making, I think that's I'm making a much more modest statement, which is there simply weren't four votes for Judge Rosenblatt's test. Uh, and I'm and, also and, saying what, what and just, just going, I did try to quickly read the, the decision while we were here. I think the, in the concurring opinion, there is a statement saying that if they believed that the governor's language had crossed the line, they would go the other way. But they were agreeing with Judge Smith that in this case, it didn't. Yes, they, they, but, but that, that's, that's prototypical Thank dictum. You. If I believed, I would do this. I, I take uh, Assemblyman Brodsky's point. For those who are cynical and despair about the quality and nobility of public service and public officials, you've just heard from five individuals who wielded government power with a thoughtfulness and an integrity and an honor that is inspiring. Please join me in thanking you. Before I turn it over to Ray for a housekeeping matter or two, let me just share with you this one final point. In about two and a half years, the voters of the state of New York on a November are going to go to the ballot and they're going to be handed a ballot and there will be on it 12 words, 12 simple words. Shall there be a convention to revise the Constitution and amend it? Over the course of the next two and a half years, the Rockefeller Institute, the Government Law Center, the State Bar Association, and other organizations are going to be putting on programs and forums like this to heighten interest, to spark curiosity, and debate the great issues. On a personal note, I am pleased and proud that all of us here today can say we were there when that conversation began. Thank you very much.